Hello everyone, I am here with a Bible study. Tonight's Bible study is going to be Psalm 78. So we're going to read Psalm 78, and then we have a devotion that goes with it, and then a little something extra at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and read Psalm 78, and it is a mascal of Asaph. O oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, what we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law. They forgot what he had done, the wonders he had shown them. He did miracles in the sight of their fathers. In the land of Egypt, in the region of Zon, he divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand firm like a wall. He guided them with the cloud by day and with light from the fire all night. He split the rocks in the desert and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rock crag and made water flow down like rivers. But they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the desert against the Most High. They willingful, willingfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the desert? When he struck the rock, water gushed out, and streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us food? Can he supply meat for his people? When the Lord heard them, he was very angry. His fire broke out against Jacob, and his wrath rose against Israel, for they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. Yet he gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grains of heaven. Men ate the bread of angels. He sent them all the food they could eat. He let loose the east wind from the heavens and led forth the south wind by his power. He rained meat down on them like dust, flying birds like sand on the seashore. He made them come down inside their camp, all around their tents. They ate till they had more than enough. They had been given them what they craved, but before they turned from the food they craved. Even while it was still in their mouths, God's anger rose against them. He put to death the sturdiest among them, cutting down the young men of Israel. In spite of all this, they kept on sinning. In spite of this, in spite of his wonders, they did not believe. So he ended their days in futility and their years in terror. Wherever God slew them, they would seek him. They eagerly turned to him again. They remembered that God was their rock, that God Most High was theirs, their Redeemer. But then they would flatter him with their mouths, lying to him with their tongues. Their hearts were not loyal to him. They were not faithful to his covenant, yet he was merciful. He forgave their iniquities and did not destroy them. Time 
After a time he restrained his anger and did not stir up his full wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a passing breeze that does not return. How often they rebelled against him in the desert and grieved him in the wasteland. Again and again they put God to the test. They vexed the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power. The day he redeemed them from the oppressor, the day he displayed his miraculous signs in Egypt, his wonders in the region of Zon, he turned the rivers into blood. They could not drink from their streams. He sent swarms of flies that devoured them and frogs devastated them. He gave their crops to the grasshopper, their produce to the locust. He destroyed their vines with hell and their sycamore figs with sleet. He gave over their cattle to the hell, their livestock to bolts of lightning. He unleashed against them his hot anger, his wrath, indignation, and hostility, a band of destroying angels. He prepared a path for his anger. He did not spare them from death, but gave them over to the plague. He struck down all the firstborn of Egypt, the first fruits of manhood in the tents of Ham, but he brought his people out like a flock. He led them like sheep through the desert. He guided them safely so they were unafraid, but the sea engulfed their enemies. Thus he brought them to the border of his holy land, to the hill country his right hand had taken. He drove our nations before them and allotted their lands to them as an inheritance. He settled the tribes of Israel in their homes, but they put God to the test and rebelled against the Most High. They did not keep his statutes like their fathers. They were disloyal and faithless, as unreliable as a faulty bow. They angered him with, they angered him with their high places. They aroused his jealousy with their idols. When God heard them, he was very angry. He rejected Israel completely. He abandoned the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent he had set up among men. He sent the ark of his might into captivity, his splendor into the hands of the enemy. He gave his people over to the sword. He was very angry with his inheritance. Fire consumed their young men and their maidens had no wedding songs. Their priests were put to the sword, and their widows could not weep. Then the Lord awoke as from sleep, as a man awakes from a stupor of wine. He beat back his enemies. He put them to everlasting shame. Then he rejected the tents of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. He built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth that he established forever. He chose David his servant, and he took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands he led them. And of course, that, that's the end of um, our psalm today. Um, of course, this is talking about when God freed the Israelites, the Hebrews, from the land of Egypt. From the hands of Pharaoh. And they, when he did, they kept wanting more and more stuff from him. And when God wouldn't, didn't help them, when they wanted something, they would get mad at God and turn away and curse God and God would get angry with them and if God didn't give them what they wanted right now they would they turned to an idol at one time they even built their own idol they threw gold into a machine thing they like into a fire pit thing they threw all their gold in there and an image came out as a calf and they worshiped the calf over God they turned their backs on God many, many times, and God kept helping them over and over again. They would praise God when they needed him, and then after that was over, they would 
turn their backs on God again and then go back to him again when they needed him and so forth over and over. If you have somebody in your life like that, you, I'm sure you know what how it is. Somebody that disuses you, comes into your life when they want you to do something for you. Like, hey, I need you to do something for me, but never wants anything to do with you any other time. Something like that. Okay, the devotion today is by Jeanette Hanscom. And here's the devotion. My dad's family built a vacation cabin in the Sierras. When I was in kindergarten, it's full of memories of snow trips, hot days at the lake, and playing house under an oak tree with my sisters and cousins, using a nearby stump as our kitchen. Some things haven't been updated since the 70s, like the rosewood paneling and countertops and storing sleds in an unfurnished room known as the dungeon. Other things have changed. The TV now gets more than three fuzzy channels, and we finally remodeled the bedrooms. Now a new generation is collecting memories of the cabin. This summer, I lugged my suitcase to the bedroom I'd claimed and spotted Grandma's copy of Streams in the Desert and her father's Bible sitting on the top of the cabin journal, a fake leather diary that I'd left that I'd left so many who wanted to could write in it. I picked up the devotional for me that and the Bible represented a legacy far sweeter than the journal or even the place where I'd spent so much of my childhood. They reflected the foundation of faith that began when Grandma became the first family member to accept Jesus as her Savior. I hoped that I would continue to pass down what she started. When my sons visit the cabin, I want them to find memories of fun and reminders of Jesus. As a follower of Christ, each of us has someone to thank for our faith in him. A parent, a grandparent, a close friend. Our gratitude for their enormous gift can motivate us to do everything in our power to pass it on to the next generation. Amen. We need to pass Jesus on, that's for sure. To the next generation, to everybody. Anybody that you can and everybody that you can, please pass Jesus on. All right, there is our devotion. What's it say for our homework tonight? Why do you have to thank, oh, who do you have to thank for your faith? Who are you trying to pass your legacy on to? Take a moment to thank Jesus for what you have and record it. So who do you have to thank for your faith? And who are you trying to pass, pass your faith on to? Who are you trying to, you know, have get saved? A lot of people I'd like to get saved. I wish would get saved. But, you know, we can't make them get saved. Because that's not, you know, you can't make somebody get saved. It has to be in their heart. They have to want to get saved. It has to be in their heart. They just can't get saved to make, to make us happy. Because that's not right. It has to be in their heart. They have to want to get saved. God knows because God and Jesus know their hearts. They know if they're doing it for the right reasons. Okay, I got three more circle of kindness to read to you guys. So let me read these. Hope you guys like these. The first one is by Judy Power from Orlando, Florida. She says, his kindness was a true Christmas miracle. I was newly single with three little boys. Christmas was coming up fast and my church had just paid Christmas was coming up fast and my church had just paid my electric and water bill because I had no income. I knew my boys would not have Christmas that year. I was absolutely heartbroken. Then a friend from high school days 
who lived nearby, was aware of my situation, showed up with toys for my boys and a new outfit for me. His kindness was a true Christmas miracle. He renewed my faith in humanity and my belief in Santa Claus. <laughs> wow. Only takes a little bit to make a child happy, you know. And the second one is by Dace Pedicus from Tacoma, Washington. She said my birthday song made her day. When I worked as a market researcher, people often take their anger out on me and my co-workers. But one kind person can make up for a... Wait. But one kind person can make up for a hundred hostile ones. I once called an elderly person who told me it was her birthday. I jokingly replied that since I'm a bad singer, my gift to her would be not to sing. She replied that she was 80, lived alone, and had no one to sing to her. Oh, so sad. I thought that won't do, so I softly sang happy birthday to her. She said my song made her day. It made mine too. That is so sad. I want to take her home. That's sad. Wonder where her family is. That's going to be like us, like Sherman and I. Maybe she don't got kids because we don't got kids either. She probably don't got no family. Um, okay. And the last one is by Shane and Gills from Crossville, Illinois. We were blown away by his generosity. Every Christmas Eve, both sides of our family and several friends go out for dinner. This has been our tradition for 20 years. Last year, there were around 25 of us. We enjoyed a good meal, laughed, and had a great time. When it was time for a meal, I always do that. When it was time for the waitress to bring our bill, she said a man had heard us having such a great time that he had paid for our bill. Oh, where'd they go? How many people was there? 25. Where'd they eat? good time that he paid for our bill it was six hundred and seventy two dollars with the tip included where did they eat six hundred and seventy two dollars we were blown away with his generosity to keep the kindness going we gave what we could when we had given a tip to our waitress she was very thankful just as we were Twenty-five people, even. But if you go to Golden Corral or somewhere like a Golden Corral Ponderosa around here, we don't have no fancy restaurants like that around here. Fanciest thing we got around here is like a Golden Corral. Take twenty-five people around here and eat. It ain't gonna cost no six hundred dollars. And you could sit there and eat and eat and eat. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Six hundred seventy-two dollars. I can't get over that. Oh my gosh. Woo. That's crazy. That's a lot of jack. Yeah, that's a lot of money. And somebody paid for that. That's that's amazing. They must be rich. Wow. Uh, all right, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed tonight's Bible study, and I hope you guys have a great night's sleep. Bye, guys.